Hey, deserving listeners. Today's episode is about the psychology of the TV show Fleabag, which is on Amazon, I believe. It's one of my favorite shows of all time. I was really surprised at how good it was and how much I liked it. I like it up there with my favorite shows like The Americans or Black Mirror or It's Always Sunny. If you haven't seen it, it's not a big commitment. It's only 12 episodes for over, you know, six episodes a season for two seasons. And it looks like they're not going to make any more seasons, which is a very British thing to do. And each episode is only 25 minutes long. And it moves really fast. It is extremely touching and very human and very hilarious. It is both surreal, but very real at the same time. Uh, it's hilarious in a way that I've never seen before. That when she looks at the camera, it, it conveys so much emotion. You know, a lot of the fourth wall breaking things like Deadpool or uh, The Office, this kind of stuff, they'll look at the camera, but it's more like a one way communication. Fleabag, you feel like you're in a relationship with this person. Like she she sees you. <laughs> And, and you, you know, you have a relationship, this sort of private relationship with this person. It's really weird how she managed to pull that off. Phoebe Waller-Bridge created it and stars in it. Uh, it's, the TV show is based on her one-woman show first performed on stage uh, in 2013, and it was converted in, and adapted for TV. She's amazing. Uh, the writing, the acting... Her facial, her facial expressions communicate so much in such little time. Like I said, the, the TV show moves really fast. It's just boom, boom, boom. This year, 2019, it had 11 Emmy nominations and won six, including Outstanding Comedy Series, Outstanding Lead Actress by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, and Outstanding Writing by Phoebe Waller-Bridge. She also wrote and created the Killing Eve TV show, and she's helping to write the new Bond movie for next year in 2020. And she is in a new relationship with the uh, director and writer Martin McDonough, who wrote and directed some of my favorite movies in Bruges, Seven Psychopaths, Three Billboards Outside Emming, Missouri. Uh, they're the new power couple. So I'm going to get into the psychology of Fleabag and all the characters in the TV show. Because as I was watching it, I was just like, there's so much to say about psychology and family systems and psychodynamics. And so let's get into it. Uh, this is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. This episode is going to be spoiled. I'm going to spoil... I'm gonna, I didn't say that right. I'm going to spoil the entire, you know, 12 episodes of Fleabag. So if you haven't seen it, I'd go watch it and come back. I imagine that it's not terrible to have the TV show spoiled because it's not like the TV show has twists or anything. Uh, so uh, if you decide to listen to this and then watch it later, I can't imagine that being a terrible thing. Okay, so let's get into it now. So since I've been making all these episodes about schema therapy, I thought I would analyze her through that lens first. So first, when we're looking at people's schemas, we have to think about their core emotional needs that they've had since they were born. And I would speculate that all of her core emotional needs throughout her childhood and adult life were probably challenged, but not severely, because she doesn't seem that um, you know, uh, pathological, if you will. Uh, given her adult behavior, it's not that out of the ordinary, but she has some issues, right? So I think that uh, she, if she were a real person, we would find that some of her childhood core emotional needs were challenged. Now, I don't think she went through any over abuse, but I, th but I think she went through some emotional neglect, um, what, you know, which I would speculate about. Uh, we know it's hard to know what her relationship was like with her mother because her mother died before the TV show begins. We know that the father and the sister are fairly distant and avoidant regarding emotions. And it seems probable that the mother was also uh, in the way that uh, Fleabag, and it, the, the main character Fleabag, she, that's her name in the credits is Fleabag. <laughs> so I'm going to be referring to her as, as Fleabag. 
Uh, but anyway, so we know that the father, when you see him in, in the TV show, he's very cold, very distant. He's there, but he's sort of absent. He, he avoids things pretty severely, doesn't really notice when people are suffering, doesn't really reach out to people in a nurturing way. And we could imagine that that would have really challenged the needs of Fleabag as she was young. Also, there's some reference to the mother, Fleabag's mother, at, at being difficult in the same way that Fleabag was. So maybe the mother was jokey and a little superior in a way as a defense against her own loneliness, which I'll get into later. So we could assume that the mother and father weren't the most nurturing parents and would challenge many of the um, of the core emotional needs. The eight that I have uh, categorized are secure attachments, love, attention, attunement. Then you have, so you can, so you can imagine the, the need of Fleabag as a child to be loved and paid attention to and attuned to was challenged, again, at least by the father. The second need of safety and stability and predictability. The father seems very predictable and stable, but Again, according to what they were saying about the mom, the mom may have been fairly chaotic and might have uh, threatened, to some extent, Fleabag's uh, stability when she was young. Hard to know. Number three, a sense of identity. This is fostered in children when you pay attention to them and really help them with their own emotional states and with their, with their lives. And when you reflect to them what's happening for them, they learn to develop a sense of self, a sense of who they are. They know their emotions. They know who they are. They have, they have self-esteem. And when you have parents who are fairly cold or chaotic, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, uh, throughout this conversation, I'm probably going to generally categorize the fathers being cold. But it's more than that if you watch the show. But I'm just going to say cold is sort of a place marker for that. And then speculating that the mother was chaotic and perhaps a little avoidant in her in her own jokey way. So when you have a mother that's um, cold and jokey, and you have a do you have a, you know, and chaotic, and you have a father that's cold and uh, sort of predictable, it's hard for you as a child to develop a sense of who you are because your your parents aren't really helping you with your emotional states, and so you don't really know what's happening. You don't really know. Uh, what, how to connect with your innards, if that makes any sense. Um, listen to my other episodes on a sense of self, if you want more discussion on that, because it's kind of complicated. Number four is the need to uh, express your needs and emotions spontaneously. In this family, again, speculating on what the mom was like, it seems as though no one is allowed to really express their needs or emotions spontaneously and in a way that other people will hear. You could imagine Fleabag as a child expressing her needs and the father ignoring it. So uh, you could see that that, challenge, that need would be challenged. Number five, the need for autonomy and competence. It seems like this one might have been fostered in both the kids. The bo both the kids seem mostly competent and mostly autonomous. Fleabag, I think, suffers from some internalized incompetence. Number six is the need for acceptance and praise. Again, when you grow up in a cold and chaotic family, the, there's not a, usually there's not a ton of praise given to the kids. And I don't think these kids were given enough praise. They, give, they were given some, but not enough, because again, they suffered in a lot of ways. Number seven is realistic limits and self-control. And this is the uh, need that ch all children have to learn their limits in a realistic way and to learn how to control themselves, to control their emotions, to control their impulses. And I think they got a good dose of that in some ways, but I think the mother might have modeled a, a lack of self-control and might have helped Fleabag to uh, also lack some self-control. Not terribly so, but some. Number eight, the last core emotional need we have growing up is a need for guidance and mentoring. And it seems like maybe they did get some of that. Uh, hard to know that one. Okay, so let's go into the 18 schemas here. The first one is P 
people are undependable. I believe from Fleabag's behavior that she had the schema of people are undependable. When Fleabag, you know, was was growing up with this chaotic, cold parenting style, she began to learn, huh, you know what, when I have, uh, when I need attachments, when I need people to pay attention to me and attune to me, when I need nurturance and that, that warm blanket of, of a loved one, they're not dependable. They're not always there. Maybe dad works a lot. Maybe mom's sort of chaotic and doing various different things. And people with this schema will, as an adult, agree with statements like, I feel lonely or I feel that I lack a stable emotional support from others, or I expect close relationships to end, or people close to me will leave or die. So even the adult experience for Fleabag of her best friend, Boo, dying, killing herself, can actually disrupt your psyche to the point where it can change your personality, and you can adopt a new schema. So let's just say you know, uh, that Fleabag grew up with mostly stable relationships, mostly nurturing relationships. And then, boom, her best friend is ripped away from her and suddenly dies. And this is very disruptive, very, um, very uh, scary to her. And now Fleabag naturally is like, well, why would I want to be close to anybody? Because they're, they, they're just going to die. They're just going to leave me. They're just going to kill themselves or, you know, something's going to go wrong. And so that, that, that schema seems to be at play in this, in this character Fleabag. Now, she rarely dips into expressing those feelings. What you'll see is people's maladaptive coping, which are in a, they're very different flavors to coping with this schema of not being able to believe that people are dependable and that the people will love her. One way is to surrender to the schema and say, well, I guess people are independable. You know, no one's going to be there for me. And I should just, I should just um, give into that and surrender to that notion because why fight it? And the way that you surrender to this notion is by selecting partners who can't make a commitment, like the hot guy and the priest. These are two men that she dates and and pursues who, right from the start, are not good candidates to pursue. Of all the fish in the sea in London, she pursues uh, two fellas who, uh, particularly the priest, who are unattainable. <laughs> and so what this will do is it's like, well, if, if nurturing is unattainable and people are just going to leave me anyway, I might as well just be with people who are, who I'm going to predict are going to leave me. And we do this for a number of reasons. Uh, Freud identified it way long ago, repetition, compulsion, and, and projective identification, object relationness, identifying projective identification, identify this long time too. Essentially, we uh, do this for a number of reasons. One is it we can make life more predictable if we choose to have our life go down, down the tubes. The idea, and this is mostly subconscious, you, when you are predicting, look, people are going to leave me. You, you have two choices. You can either try to have people not leave you and then have people leave you because you believe... You, you're like, 100% people are going to leave me. So you can try to have people not leave you by pursuing them, by pursuing stable people, but, but they're going to leave you anyway. And then it's really going to hurt. Or you can pursue people who are, you pretty much know they're going to leave you, or you're pretty much sure it's not going to work out. And it still hurts when it ends, but at least you kind of knew it from the beginning. And so it's a lesser of two evils. Now, of course, the, um, the irony here is that it's shooting yourself in the foot. And if you actually dated people who weren't predicted to leave you, you act, they might actually not leave you. But that's part of the schema is it keeps us in that space. People who are neglected growing up have a tendency to date neglecting people as an adult and therefore get more neglect as they age. Um, the other way to combat this schema and this terrible realization, quote unquote, 
that everyone's just going to leave you is that you can just avoid relationships. And she does that also. She really tries to avoid being close to people. Number two schema, people are harmful emotionally or physically. So this is usually when you're abused. And I don't think she has that schema. Number three schema, people don't care about me. So that's, that's the third schema here. People as, a, as adults will agree with statements like, I haven't gotten enough love or nurturance from others. For most of my life, I have not had someone who really cares to listen to me or to understand me. So this is very similar to the other, uh, to the first schema. You know, one is of abandonment and this one's of um, basically emotional neglect. I'm actually thinking about um, combining these two schemas because they're just so similar. Uh, and they're often, they often go hand in hand. When you have one, you tend to have the other. But anyway, so f- again, when you, when you have people who are, um, who don't care about you, then you will select emotionally depriving people, you surrender, or you don't reach out to others. So that's another way of surrendering. It's just like to this schema of is like, well, why reach out to others? Why confide in others? Because they're, they're not going to notice or they're not going to care. So why bother? And this uh, perpetuates the neglect because if you never reach out, then you never even get a, give a chance to other people to take care of you. And then you never get your, you never get cared for. Another way is again, to avoid relationships. Um, Another thing that she does in uh, to cope with this schema that she believes 100% to be true, no one really cares about me, is to identify as a very horny person. Uh, She does this when she wants security. So this is actually something that's um, typically more male than female, but uh, plenty of, of, of women do this as well. It's the, what is essentially what happens for some people is, I mean, you know, people have varying libidos. And so some people are more horny than others and that's fine. But we see in Fleabag, someone who is suffering a lot and has been through massive loss and has a lot of pent up sadness and is deeply uh, self, she has a lot of self hatred and feels very shameful and very guilty and very alone. And yet on the surface, she seems very happy-go-lucky and very frivolous and a girl about the town. And she likes to, you know, uh, hit on every, I mean, she hits on everyone. Like uh, there's this really drunk girl who uh, is like passing out and uh, she, uh, she tries to have sex with her. <laughs> like it, and she, it just seems like all she, but so one way to look at that is she's very horny or another way of looking at it is she's a flea bag. But those aren't very satisfying conceptualizations to me because they don't really make a lot of sense. It's, they're more cultural judgments of people. Below that, if we look again at the psychology of people like this, we all at a fundamental level need to have closeness, intimacy, security, cuddling, uh, someone that we can depend on, someone we know is out there either right there next to us loving us or at least somewhere in the world loving us. We need that. It is a, it's a need. And when you don't have that notion, I mean, some of you listening out there might actually be in those shoes of that you don't really have anyone in your life who you know really loves you, who has your back, who will drop everything for you, who thinks about you, who just randomly reaches out to you and hugs you and, and takes care of you. When you don't have that, uh, it's rough. We are, you know, like puppies uh, seeking other animals to snuggle with and be with. We we try to act like we're not, particularly people in London, by the way, culturally speaking, try to act like we're all, you know, above it all, but we're not. And one of the ways that we cope with that in our weird culture is to act like we're very horny and to be very sexual. It's somehow more acceptable to reach out to people sexually, particularly again, if you're socialized as a male, uh, than to reach out in a way of, of saying I'm lonely. It's, it's very like, just imagine you're with some friends and, and they're like, 
um, hey, how you feeling? And you're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm getting kind of horny lately. Like that's, although maybe a little TMI, you're, you're going to get some, some laughs. You're going to be, oh yeah, well, I, I've, been, I've been there before. But you know, you walk up uh, again, let's rewind the tape. Friend walks up to you, says, how you doing? And you're like, I am lonely. I feel like I, I need someone to love me. That's a much more intense statement, right? And it's harder to admit to people. It's harder to admit to ourselves. So people will channel their need for closeness into a very narrow space of horniness. Actually, clients will do this to their own therapists. They'll, they'll get real horny for their therapists. And what's happening is they are uh, channeling all of their need for nurturance and closeness through their loins, if you will. And that's fine in therapy. There's nothing, it's a normal actual phase of therapy. But we see Fleabag doing this. She's alone. She has no one that really takes care of her. She doesn't really accept love and attention from people who are offering it, like her boyfriend. And she, and then she finds this drunk girl on the street and she starts to take care of her and she has this closeness with her. Like, oh, I'm this human being is close to me and... I have this urge to cuddle with this person and she, but she frames it as a sexual thing and she hits on her. Has the same experience with this uh, woman mentor that she has a drink with in season two, great scene. The woman that she gave the award to. And again, she meets her, they have this very real frank conversation and Fleabag, I'm guessing deep down, just wants to connect, just wants to be like, Will you be my mother? Will you tuck me in at night? Will you take, will you love me? Will you be there for me? Cause you just seem like such a real wonderful woman. But instead of saying th something like that, because it's too, it's too hard to say, it's really hard to admit to oneself. She just kisses her and tries to have sex with her. And that's, uh, that's a way that we deal with a schema that no one will be there for us is to uh, just just uh, focus really on on sexual conquest and and activity. All right, this next schema, the fourth schema, is I am defective. This is the schema where adults will agree with statements like, "No one could love me once they saw the real me," or, "I'm terrified that my defects will be exposed to others." So this is a lot of shame, just believing that you're nothing and you're just a bad person and you might not even have a clear idea as to why it is. You just sort of know in your bones, there's something wrong with you. You're not worthy. And you know, you got to trick people to like you. And she seems to have this one as well, probably from the way she was treated growing up, uh, neglected by her father and, uh, you know, experiencing a chaotic love from her mother. And the way that she deals with this in the show with, so we don't, we don't necessarily see the schema, but we see the way she copes with it. And the way she copes with it is to beat herself up. You know, when, when you want to surrender to the idea, you know, one way of surrender to, if, if you have this idea of just like, I'm a terrible person, one way of coping with it is just the surrender. Yes, I give up. Yep, I'm a terrible person. And she beats herself up for her friend dying. And she beats herself up for having a terrible life. Another way to surrender is to self-sabotage, is to drive your life down the tubes and make sure that uh, you have reasons to beat yourself up. If you believe that you're a terrible person, and you kind of struggle with this notion, one way of gaining control over that is just to, well, if I'm a terrible person uh, and, my, and I'm worthless, then I guess I'll just make my life worthless and then maybe I'll be in control of it on some level. And so she definitely self-sabotages. There's a lot of things she does that um, harms herself in her life. Another way of coping with this pain on the inside of that shame is to avoid to avoid relationships and avoid expressing true thoughts and feelings and also avoid things that she can do well at. Like when you think about her life, 
we see her beginning a season one where she owns a cafe and it's failing. And there's just so many other things that I imagine she could have been doing, right? She, she, she needs money to keep the cafe afloat. And we just have to wonder what else could she be doing where it wouldn't be so uh, open to failure? I mean, cafes are probably really hard to keep afloat in London. And so there's got to be like a regular, you know, salary job that she could do that she wouldn't fail at, you know? So the fact that she sticks around in this might be evidence that she's trying to reaffirm to herself that, yeah, I'm a shameful, horrible person, and I, I can't even get this cafe off the ground. Now, there's all these other reasons why she keeps the cafe afloat. It, it's a reminder of her best friend, and, and she likes the cafe and that kind of thing. Anyway, but she actually reveals this deep shame in season two, I believe, and she, she talks about how she doesn't have anything. And then she talks about how she wished that she didn't even exist. Or maybe it's season one. I'm not quite sure. But she, she has this breakdown moment. She just talks about, I don't have anything. I have no one. I'm, I, I wish I didn't even exist. And then she says, the only thing I have is my body. And when that gets old and unfuckable, I might as well just kill it. You know, it, so her self-worth is has that her only self-worth lies in the fact that she's quote unquote fuckable and without that she's got nothing so that shows to me two things one she has deep shame and two she wasn't raised well enough to actually develop a sense of who she is and her self-worth that the parenting that she went through with her father and her mother was not sufficient enough for her to have qualities that she could rely on other things that she could fall back on that would make her feel that she was worth something and not ashamed um either everyone feels like this oh and then she says either everyone feels like this at least a little bit or else i'm completely alone so this is another uh, very breakdown moment for her she's just like um you know I i'm pretty sure everyone else is feeling this too that getting old is terrible and that they feel terrible about themselves. I mean, it, I, I, am I alone? And then she thinks, you know, because if, if other people aren't feeling this and they can't, they don't understand what's, what I'm going through here, then yeah, I'm just completely alone in this. So that's a, you know, it's a very, very touching moment in the show. Number five schema that uh, we can look to is I don't fit in. I don't think she has that schema. The, next, the sixth schema here is I am incompetent. And I think she has a bit of this one. People with this schema as adults, and I imagine Fleabag would I agree with statements like, I do not feel capable. I often need other people to help me. I don't cope well by myself. I'm better off when others are taking care of me. I have trouble doing things unless someone guides me. I often screw things up. I sometimes feel like a child in an adult world. Adult responsibilities often overwhelm me. So this is, this is a pretty uh, poignant or central schema that we see presented in the TV show Fleabag, in the character Fleabag. One way to deal with this schema of, you know what, I'm incompetent. I'm ashamed of myself. No one will be there for me. And I'm not good at things. And the way that you can cope with this one way, again, is to surrender. And the way you surrender to this is you, is you just say, I, I give up. I can't. I, I'm incompetent. And there's no road to me being competent. So I, I, I'm just going to ask for help a lot. And she does. Uh, at the beginning of the show, right away, we see that she has a history of asking her brother or, or sist asking her sister and her father for money. And they uh, seem to be predicting like, okay, did you come over here because you're going to ask for money? And, they're, and she's like, no, even though she was. And so that's a way of surrendering to your incompetence of just like, I don't, I don't have what it takes to get out of these jams. I need other people to help me. Another way to surrender, again, is to self-sabotage, as I was saying before. Another way to fail and or to, another way to surrender to this schema is to give the impression that she's not capable, uh, which she does a lot. She, if you watch her life and if you knew her as as a person, as a sister, as a daughter, 
you just get this, this impression like she was on the edge of failure at any given moment. And another way to cope with this schema of, you know what, I'm, in, I'm incompetent, is to overcompensate. To overcompensate by trying to be very independent and never asking for any help. And I, so I think she did that too. I think she would vacillate between uh, surrendering and just being like, please help me, to overcompensating by acting like everything was fine and she didn't need any help. One of the uh, areas to look into, and this is when we start dipping into psychodynamic theory, is the idea of masochism. And I think that relates to her schema of incompetence. Masochism, there's a lot of ways to define it, but the way that it's generally defined in the psychodynamic literature is not necessarily a sexual thing. I mean, often it can be, but more generally, it's just an unconscious self-defeating acting out. So there's, there's sexual masochism where you like to be beat during sex and you get off on being beat or put down or something. Uh, but I'm talking about the personality masochism where you just try to destroy yourself through self-defeating, self-sabotage, and it's all unconscious. So there are many types of it, but the way that she does it is in a couple ways. One is, is to assume that things will always go badly. So she might as well get it over with, at least, you know, having some control over the process. So this is, again, this incompetence. It's like, you know what, I, I, I'm a terrible person. So it's sort of a mixture of I, I'm ashamed of who I am and I'm incompetent. And then it's just like, well, uh, then I'm going to masochistically assume that I'm a terrible person, assume I'm going to screw things up, and then I'm just going to make myself screw it up. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, punish myself by screwing up things, if that makes any, any sense. Um, another is in this deep shame mode where you, this idea that it's like, well, I need to be punished for what happened. I'm so incompetent that I couldn't be friends to my best friend. I couldn't keep my best friend. I had to have sex with her boyfriend. I'm incompetent. I'm a terrible person. I need to be punished. And she, you know, punishes herself uh, throughout the TV show and, and, and puts herself in harm's way and, and fails uh, and does all these um, unconscious things to make herself fail. Like, um, I mean, so even if we go back to uh, the beginning of the storyline, she had sex with her best friend's boyfriend. This is, we, I could assume that before she did that, she had this general sense of incompetence and shame. And what's a wonderful way to sabotage your life? Cheating. Cheating is one of the best ways to sabotage your life when you believe that you're worth nothing. When you believe you are worthless, one of the fastest ways to affirm the fact that you're worthless is to cheat and then get caught or cheat and not get caught for that matter. It's to cheat and then to be so guilty, feel so terrible about yourself that, that um, you just like, I'm a scumbag, I'm a flea bag. And so she has sex with her best friend's boyfriend and what a wonderful way to, to, to surrender to the notion that she's a terrible person and uh, and then it happened, and then she had then she had this sort of actual concrete reason to to you know hate herself. Another thing that she did here uh, in the t show in the very beginning was she took her she took her shirt off in front of her banker. It's a very funny scene, but uh, essentially she 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 ran to the banker because she's trying to get this loan right, and she's sweaty. And she uh, is she she's going to take her sweater off, and she thinks she has a shirt on underneath, but she doesn't. She just has her bra. And as she's trying to get this loan, she, she appears to be taking her shirt off as a way of trying to use sex to get the loan, right? And then the banker is very you know sort of uh, you know put off by that and doesn't give her the loan. And the. Uh, the thinking so on the surface you say well she just made this mistake it was just this you know uh gaff that she committed that she didn't have a shirt underneath but freud might look at that as an unconscious effort to sabotage her life unconscious masochism of her 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 unconscious mind knew 
that she did not have a shirt on underneath that sweater. And her unconscious, so, so her unconscious convinced her conscious mind, you do have a shirt on underneath and you might as well take off your sweater. And then you try to take off your sweater and then it creates this masochistic thing where you feel like an incompetent person, you're ashamed, you're, you're a pervert. It's all in this perverted line of thinking, right? It's like, wow, I, I am a pervert. And she talks about that later. She's just like, I'm a pervert. I'm a terrible pervert. And that's a way of, of beating yourself up for the shame that she got into by cheating on, by, you know, having sex with her best friend's boyfriend. Um, so yeah, I hope I'm making this clear. Uh, and I, I'm sorry if I'm beating a dead horse here, but just to be clear about this, she already felt incompetent and ashamed. So she needed to reaffirm that and she needed to act out unconsciously to surrender to that notion. And so she did so by cheating, by having sex with her girlfriend's boyfriend. And in that process, she starts to say, oh, in the way that I'm ashamed of myself and the way that I'm incompetent is I'm a sex crazed pervert. She's actually not a sex crazed pervert. What she is, is deeply ashamed of herself. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, um, she took the statue from the stepmom's house. That was self-destructive. She was on and off again with her boyfriend. That was self-destructive. She dropped that trophy. That would be another Freudian slip, if you will, that Freud would look at. It's like, why did you pick up that giant glass trophy? And then why did you drop it? Did you really do it on accident? Or were you actually tr acting out your, uh, t you know, what Freud might say is you're acting out one your desire for masochism and to reaffirm the fact that you are a terrible person. Then you have these traumas, you know, in your earlier life around being a terrible person. You're trying to act that out and trying to make sure that it actually uh, happens. And two, you might actually be aggressive towards your sister and you want to get back at her, but you don't have a way to do that uh, in, you know, uh, polite ways and the ways that you consider to be, ways that you can do, you know, like, like I'm guessing that Fleabag would love to t tell her sister, you're uptight and you're mean to me and you hurt my feelings a lot and I need you to stop that. But Fleabag doesn't say that. But so Freud would say, instead of saying that you drop the trophy as a way of getting back to her, getting back to her. Um, another thing she did is she got drunk at the art show and made a scene. So that was self-destructive. That was masochistic. And she dated a guy who treated her badly sexually um, and treated her body badly sexually. Although, you know, in the show, she seemed to be fine with it. But at the very least, she dated a guy who didn't really necessarily care about her. And she sort of knew that. Or at least she, she knew that he didn't like her for the right reason. Um, anyway, so that all has to do with this incompetence and shame schema. Other schemas, I'm not going to go into that. I don't think she has. I'll just skip to the ones I think she has. The 10th schema, um, I must get what I want or else I'll never get what I want. So this is sort of a, an entitled schema. When children are raised in a certain way, they can emerge with a personality of entitlement. I deserve what I, you know, what, what I, if I want something, I deserve it. And if I don't get it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish people. I'm going to be upset. Uh, people with this schema will often break rules that they think don't really apply to them. They also have trouble accepting no for an answer. They get irritable when they don't get what they want. And I think that she had this kind of, and I think it's because her dad was distant and didn't really parent her well. And I think her mom might've spoiled her, just speculation. And I think that Fleabag surrenders to this schema by treating other people badly, by manipulating her boyfriend by pursuing the priest. I mean, most people would not pursue a priest sexually. They'd be like, well, that's against the rules. One, two, it, it's like, you just don't do that. Three, I could ruin his life. I could ruin my life. This is, this, you know, I, even though, okay, you know, I'm sexually, uh, so let's just say she didn't have the schema. She meets him and she's like, huh, attractive guy. I like his personality. If he, but he's a priest, so I'm not going to go there. But because she has this entitlement, she doesn't like being told no. And you'll see this in people, sort of a rebellion schema. 
you'll see this in people where uh like what's an example they they'll go to a restaurant and on the uh you know reader board they'll be like you know we're at a lobster and the person will be like even though they didn't really want lobster suddenly now they want lobster because they're just like um uh i i you know i hate having things uh unavailable to me i don't i don't like things to i don't like things not being given to me that i might have wanted <laughs> and so they will uh pursue it another maybe another example is uh people who are always trying to scam things out of people like uh one of the things that i have a friend that does this who whenever he he does a lot of air travel and whenever he go, uh, you know is getting on a plane he's always trying to get like the perfect seat like whether it's first class or something else or his hotel room he's always trying to upgrade or uh, he's always he just he he's not sa he's never satisfied with just the way things are he's always wanting to to up his game if that makes any sense and so it's this it's this sense of entitlement and there's various different roads to having that entitlement now it's not a horrible thing uh, at a lower end of the spectrum i actually have that <laughs> i'm I'm one of those people who hates to follow silly rules. Like when my university sends out emails about mandatory trainings that I don't think I need to go to, I don't go to them. Most people go to them at my university because they're like, oh, well, I work for, I work for this university and it's mandatory, so I got to go. Well, me, I'm like, fuck that. I'm not going to go. I don't think I need to go to that training. So there's a lot of different entitlement in that attitude. One this notion that I know what I, that I don't need the training, maybe I do need the training. And two, that I'm above it, right? That I'm, I'm not like everyone else. I, I don't have to do what everyone else does. So, you know, I get that. And I think Fleabag had a little bit of this too, right? She broke a lot of social mores at the, um, at the retreat. She was frequently breaking the rules there. She couldn't, she couldn't deal with any of the rules that were imposed on her there. Uh, she steals from her stepmother. Um, she often goes against her sister's wishes, that sort of thing. So I think she had a bit of that as well. Uh, another one that I think she had along these lines was lacking willpower. I think she did lack willpower. And I think this is, again, because of her chaotic mother and her neglecting father. People with this schema, just they just believe so the first one is entitlement where they just believe they're entitled the other one is is this this notion like i just don't have willpower i just i can't control myself and i think her vice is is sex i think she believes that her libido she doesn't have any willpower over it and the idea is is that people do have the ability to actually rein these things in but they don't try really that hard because they actually don't think they're going to succeed. They just have this belief like, look, I'm a, I'm a slave to my vices. Um, and another uh, thing that people will do in this schema is they just won't hold back their emotions that they'll express whatever they feel. Cause it's just like, uh, why, why restrain yourself? People like this typically grew up with parents that didn't restrain them enough uh, in all the ways that needed, they need to be restrained. So one way to surrender to this schema is to just accept the identity of someone who acts impulsively. And I think she does that. I think she, she just identifies, she, uh, in the way that she talks, she's like, well, I'm a flea bag. So, you know, I'm a person who doesn't have willpower and I have sex randomly and I do random things and I, I'm not responsible. Another way to deal with this schema of, you know what, other people have willpower, I don't is to avoid things that require willpower, like responsibility, that kind of thing. Uh, the last schema, no, I don't think she has any other schemas. So in summary, um, because she didn't get her core emotional needs met as a child, she developed personality schemas to cope, uh, to cope with the fact that she wasn't getting her needs met. And she developed these schemas to match her reality. She's like, okay, I think I'm learning the the way the world works, uh, namely that people aren't dependable. They're going to leave me. I'm incompetent. I am entitled to things. I don't have willpower. 
I get it. That's how the world works. It's not a wonderful realization to make, but you know, it's, it's acknowledging reality. And these schemas were helpful when she was young because it helped her to cope with her, the way she was being parented. You know, if, if you just assume that you're not going to get your emotional needs met, then you don't try to get your emotional needs met. And then you don't get your feelings hurt. Well, uh, those are helpful when she's young, but as she becomes an adult, these schemas are retained and they're no longer helpful anymore, but they're retained. So even though as she emerges into her adult life and she can actually meet people who are better able to meet her, her emotional needs, she actually doesn't believe that it's possible. And so therefore creates a life that perpetuates the neglect that she went through growing up. And then you have this perpetuation of the lifestyle that reinforces the schemas of, uh, yeah, people are undependable. No one loves me. I'm entitled. Uh, you know, I need to take life by the reins or the otherwise, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, Fleabag is a very tragic character, but makes a really good show. You know, <laughs> her, her Fleabag-ness makes for a very funny and very touching show. All right, let's go to a break. All right, we're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast, do so now. Go to patreon.com. When you become a patron of the podcast, you are telling us that you like this podcast, which is a big deal to me. I get a little email every time someone, someone becomes a patron, and it's been four years of getting those little emails. And I have to say, every time I get one, I, it just warms my heart. It just is one of the ways that I just know that it's a, a value to people. Also, we are starting another scholarship. So you can go to our website and apply there. Uh, the information is all there. We've uh, given over $13,000 to uh, scholarships and charities. Uh, so that's, uh, actually, well, we haven't given the patrons have given because we, you know, we take some of them when it, when you sign up on Patreon, some of your money goes towards these various charities that we support and we've donated over $13,000 to scholarships, to LGBTQ, uh, uh, um, charities, to animal charities, to homelessness charities and so on. Okay. So let's look through the psychodynamic lens at Fleabag. So the first thing that I think is pretty notable in Fleabag's character is that she has a defective superego. Basically, when we're growing up, we have this need to develop a superego. This is the part of the psyche that is essentially an internalized parent. That part of our psyche that monitors our impulses. When we're two years old, we want to eat ice cream every day. When we're seven years old, we don't want to do our chores. When we're 18 years old, we don't want to go to work. But our parents are there to help us understand the importance of not eating, eating ice cream every day, of going to work, of doing our chores. And through this interaction with our parents, if it's done in a loving way, an attuned way, in a firm way, we internalize that parent and that parent essentially becomes a super ego, the part of our psyche. So for me, for example, when I was 16, 17, well, even 20, I did not want to clean my bathroom. I didn't care how it looked. And even though it was embarrassing on some level, I was like, well, I, I'm just not going to clean the bathroom. That's ridiculous. That's, that's what other people do. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, and I'm not going to. <laughs> and at some point in my life, that switched. I, uh, you can internalize a superego various different methods. One is, is through your parents, but another is, is actually just by internalizing other mentors and other people. But um, the point is, is that she, Fleabag, had a defective superego that we can see in the show. Again, I think because her uh, parents were neglectful and or chaotic, 
I have a feeling that her mother was childish in some ways. And as a result, she lacks self-control. And she, so there's two, we often identify only one side of the superego, uh, the self-control side, you know, the, the side of you that gets you to go to work, that gets you to clean the toilet, that gets you to not punch people in the face when you feel like it, that gets you to um, be responsible and to be nice to other people and to not um, run down the street naked yelling, you know, eat my banana or something. Uh, <clears throat> Emily, you can add that one to the list, I guess. Um, but the other side of our superego is to uh, self-soothe. We, our parents don't just control us, right? <laughs> they also soothe us. And through internalizing that, we can actually self-soothe. Uh, and that's a very important thing for maturity and for adulthood is the ability that when we're in traffic and we're alone and we're late for work and we're frustrated that we have the ability to be like, everything is going to be okay. And sometimes we'll even verbally say things that our parents would have said to us when we were, when we were young, this is our super ego, you know? So, uh, I don't know about you, but when I'm in traffic and I'm getting worked up, I'll say out loud alone in my car, calm down everything's going to be okay. Well, who am I talking to? I'm talking to me. Well, who's, who's talking? Well, I'm talking. Well, it's my superego talking to my id and my ego. And this is a self-soothing action. Another uh, important part of the superego is to compliment ourselves. Our parents are supposed to compliment us and make us feel like we're worthy people. And to say things like, you're good enough and you're smart and you're, you made a mistake. People make mistakes. And Fleabag did not have that. And that in fact, that's a ma major theme of this show is that Boo, her friend had that part of her, that part of her that could self-soothe kind of, but at least the part of her that could say, you know what? Everyone makes mistakes. That's why we have erasers on the ends of pencils, not for sticking up the butts of hamsters. <laughs> um, but Fleabag seemingly did not. When Fleabag went through a, a tough time, she didn't seem to have the ability to control herself or to soothe herself or to compliment herself. So clearly a defective superego. All right, to continue our look into Fleabag's character through a psychodynamic lens, let's look at her defenses. So defenses, um, defense mechanisms, we utilize all the time to protect us from pain, psychic pain. And when we have, we have various different uh, defenses that can help when we have various di different defenses, defenses that are not very helpful. For example, um, when say you're at work and you're reminded of your cat that died well, I'll just talk about myself. I had to put my cat down last year and I had to go to work soon after that. And I had to teach. I had to go to meetings at the university. I had to function. And so I employed a defense of avoidance and intellectualization. And that got me through the day. And then at the end of the day, when I didn't need those defenses anymore, I let myself cry. So defenses aren't terrible. They're just there. They're only terrible when they become dysfunctional, rigid, inflexible, self-destructive, um, relied on too much, this kind of thing. So that's what uh, we want to look at in Fleabag. What defenses did she use and were they problematic? A lot of what she was doing was trying to deal with the pain of the loss of her mother, the pain of the loss of her best friend, the pain of having had sex with her best friend's boyfriend, which was the uh, essential cause of her best friend's suicide and the death of two innocent people because her best friend killed two other people in her suicide attempt. But Fleabag is also dealing with other pain uh, in her psyche, which has to do with the loneliness she's experienced her whole life from a 
distant, cold older sister and a father and a chaotic mother, um, never feeling like anyone really loved her. And so there's a lot of pain she's dealing with. And it's very hard for her to deal with that pain. And one of the ways she deals with it is through humor. For example, she misses her ex. This is in season two. And she's, she bumps into him at the church and she is, she, she misses him. She's like, oh, um, well, I kind of miss him. And also, um, I, I, I feel bad for treating him badly. I feel, I feel the pain of the shame that I treated my ex-boyfriend badly. And there's a lot of different ways to deal with this in this moment. The functional way would be to say, I'm really sorry for the way I treated you. And I have to say, I miss you. I, I, there's a part of me that still loves you. And I'm really sorry. I'm just sorry for what I did. That's, that's, but that's vulnerable. That's scary. That's setting yourself up for someone to laugh at you or for someone to reject you or someone to yell at you. And if you already feel a tremendous amount of shame, it's going to be hard to deal with that. But she has to do something because she feels that pressure of that pain of that guilt and that longing for him. So what does she do? Well, she makes a joke and she says, do you still wank about me sometimes? So this is a veiled question that does communicate some level of the way that she's feeling, right? That she wants to know, do you still think about me sometimes? Because I think about you sometimes and I, and I'm sorry for what I did, but she makes it into a joke. That's a defense. It's a way of, trying to distance ourselves. It's a way of avoiding our pain, a way of trying to categorize it as a funny thing rather than a painful thing, even though it very much is a painful thing. So she says, do you still wank about me sometimes? Also, when she goes to therapy, uh, she, she uses humor and the therapist really picks up on that, really picks up on her use of humor. The therapist asks, you know, why did you come to counseling? And she says in this very flippant way, Fleabag says, because I, used, because I used to use sex to deflect from my screaming void inside my heart. From the screaming, oh, because I used to use my, <laughs> I'm a terrible actor, I, it's, I have a hard time reading lines. Because I used to use sex to deflect from the screaming void inside my heart. So she doesn't say this in a heartfelt way. She says this in a jokey way. And again, the humor allows her to say the truth, but it distances herself from the reality of it. So she doesn't have to really feel it. And she doesn't have to really deal with the consequences that she thinks are going to happen, which is that no one's going to really care. But the, the self-sabotage here is that when you joke around about those things, you don't give the impression that other people uh, should take care of you. You know, like if she said to her therapist, I feel like in my heart, there's a void and I feel like I'm using sex to avoid it. And I don't know what to do. And I, I, I'm just confused and sad and scared. And I don't know what to do. Well, what that does is it prompts other people to take care of her. Now, I don't know if that therapist would have done that because that therapist was terrible, but, but at least to the boyfriend, you know, if she would have said something like, I'm alone and I'm ashamed and I'm sorry. And I just want you to know that I, I care about you. And there's a part of me that wants you back. And I, I, I know that you're married now with a kid, but, uh, and I, you know, I'm not saying that you should come back to me, but I, I just miss you. And I just, can you hug me? Um, by doing that, she would get her needs met, right? Because he would actually, he cares about her. He would actually hug her and take care of her. But, uh, by being humorous about it, by saying, do you still wank about me? That's going to, he, she knows that's going to turn him off and he's going to be like, ugh, gross and, and move away. So her fears of being abandoned and by about not being cared of, uh, necessitate the defense of humor, which in turn necessitate other people neglecting her because she's using humor. And this is why I think the therapist at least on some level, 
is doing a good job by trying to point that out. It's like, why are you joking all the time? Like, you know, what are you trying to avoid? The therapist was terrible. I just had a horrible way of acting. This is typical uh, to the way that Hollywood will depict therapists. And by Hollywood, I mean anyone who does anything on TV or movies. Um, another defense that Fleaba, the Fleabag uses is to keep moving. She has a lifestyle of keep moving. Very, you know, when you're bored, call that guy to have sex with. Um, or, you know, keep, just keep moving. That's People will do that to avoid their pain. She also uh, uses a defense of dating men that she isn't really interested in. Because again... It avoids the pain. It avoids having to deal with what's happening. That's in season one. In season two, she dates a man who is completely unavailable. So this relationship with the priest is very distracting, right? And uh, helps her to avoid her pain because she knows that this relationship is doomed or she, she believes in all likelihood it's doomed. And so um, it helps her to avoid and, you know, because if she, st she doesn't, if she doesn't date the priest, she has to stop and really deal with the loneliness of herself and also the problems in her own family, which I'll get to in a second. Um, another uh, uh, defense with joking is that to be a wisecracker is to be superior. There's a superiority to making jokes to especially a superiority, a sort of dominance. When she says to her ex-boyfriend, do you still wank about me? It's kind of an invasive question, right? It's sort of a dominant question. I mean, how do you respond to a question like that? And so when you do stuff like that, you sort of retain this notion that you're superior. Like I'm the one who makes jokes. I'm the one in control of this conversation. And you just feel you just feel this little bit of power because you feel a lot of powerlessness. So I think she's also dealing with a deep sense of powerlessness. Another way to uh, avoid and uh, to defend against the pain is to suppress one's emotions, um, which she does. Another way is to regress. So we all will re regress to an earlier stage of development when we're faced with things that are unbearable. And there's a scene that is very poignant for this where in the confession booth, uh, she's at the low point of her life and she can't really use her normal defenses. She, her, her, the priest has helped her to get past the humor a little bit. And she finally feels a little bit of a connection to him. And in that moment, she finally just lets go and tells the truth. She tells the priest that she, that she wants someone to tell her what to do. She wants someone to take care of her. You know, responsibility is stressful, especially when you're ashamed. And so there's this fantasy that if you can just relinquish all your responsibility to someone else, that they will take care of your shame. They'll take care of your pain. They probably won't, but that's the fantasy. It's a fantasy that we all have when we are, uh, and sometimes it's fine to have that. Like, I can't wait to get home to tell my wife about my terrible day because she'll take care of me. It, there is some functionality to that. But it can be taken too far uh, for Fleabag to say, I just wish someone would tell me what to do. It, it's a fantasy that isn't likely to work because she probably wouldn't like a life where someone told her what to do all the time because she would rebel and run away from such control. But she was re regressing in that moment. Again, as a way of defending against the responsibility of having to own up to what she did. In that confession booth, she was about to tell the, the priest about her real shame. But instead, she said, I just want people to tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. And so you'll see people do this and, and you parents out there, out there, you'll see your kids do this. You'll have a 10 year old daughter who, um, you know, I don't know, knows how to clean their room. And uh, they've been irresponsible lately and they haven't cleaned their room well. And you'll come upstairs and you'll say, how come you haven't cleaned your room? 
you know, uh, what's wrong with you? How, you know, how come, and you're a kid for whatever reason, they're really struggling in the moment emotionally and, and they don't know what to do. And so they might regress in that moment. They might say, they might kind of flop on the ground and be like, I don't know. And they might look like a three-year-old in that moment, crying, throwing a tantrum, not uh, seemingly knowing how to clean their room. They might even pick something up and kind of drop it. Like, I don't know what to do. So this this is a way of trying to elicit from other people a parenting response, a response of like, let me take care of you. Let me clean your room for you. Clearly you are not capable. I'm not going to ask you to do it. So I'm just going to do it for you because I'm your mother and I'll just do it for you. And this is not a functional response. It's a normal, it's a normal defense, but it's not functional. A functional response for the 10 year old is to say, which is hard for a lot of 10 year olds. Uh, I, I just really don't want to clean my room right now, mom. And I, I get why you want me to, but I don't really care about having a clean room. And I feel like I don't want to clean my room. <laughs> Do I have to clean my room? Can we talk about this? Like some 10 year old version of that conversation, right? Or just clean the room, right? But when we're stressed out, we don't know what to do. We feel backed into a corner, we regress. Well, for Fleabag, she was backed into a corner where she was letting down her defenses. And at that moment, the natural thing to say was, I am the cause of my best friend's death because I had sex with her um, boyfriend. I'm a terrible person. And I also feel like maybe my mom's death was my fault on some level or something. And I'm confused. I don't know what to do. And I know you can't take that away. I, I know you can't t- take those feelings away from me, but I just, I guess I just need someone to talk to about that. That would be the 30 year old way of dealing with that. But she regresses and she says, I just want someone to tell me what to do. Again, normal. Another defense that we look, can look at with her is projective identification, which is my favorite defense. Long story short, and listen to my deep dives on protective identification and other episodes because it's very important uh, defense. It, it basically, in a nutshell, is we have an internalized strife that we make external. Basically, we take something inside of ourselves, we inject it into other people because we have this fantasy that we, if we give it to someone else, it we don't have it anymore. So she on the inside feels like an outsider. She feels worthless and she feels like she's hysterical. She feels like her emotions are dangerous and she feels like um, she is uh, being overly emotional, probably on the inside. And so what does she do? She, she, with projective identification, she induces her stepmother to feel like an outsider. When I first saw a uh, flea bag, I was like, oh, that stepmother, what a jerk face. But then upon rewatching it, I was looking more closely and I realized that Fleabag was being a jerk to stepmother from the beginning. Now, stepmother's a jerk for sure, but Fleabag wasn't making it any easier on stepmother. You know, Fleabag was being a jerk right from the start. And in very subtle ways, Fleabag was in a constant campaign to make stepmother feel like an outsider um, with her actions very passive actions. So the idea is this flea bag feels like an outsider on the, because she was neglected by her parents. Uh, and was, it was very, whenever you have a very cold family, people tend to feel like an outsider. Like everyone feels like an outsider. Um, and they, and everyone feels like other people are closer when they're actually, they're not. I've actually heard, seen this in families before that I've treated. We'll be in a family session. They'll be talking and one will turn to the other and say, well, you were always the one who was close to everyone. And that person will say, me? I thought you were the one who was close to everyone. It's just one of those things. When, it, when you feel like an outsider, you feel like you're the only outsider. But in reality, probably everyone in the family feels like an outsider. And I think that was true for Fleabag's family. So, she, so when the stepmother comes in the family, she induces her to feel like an outsider because she's a good candidate for that through projective identification. Fleabag also induces Boo to feel worthless by cheating on her boyfriend. 
Fleabag feels worthless on the un, on the inside. She can't deal with that worthlessness, so she has sex with her um, best friend's boyfriend. This socializes her best friend to feel worthless, and then and then uh, that the fantasy is that Fleabag doesn't have that worthlessness anymore. Fleabag also induced her boyfriend to feel emotionally hysterical. Through Fleabag's actions, she unconsciously made her boyfriend feel like an emotional wreck when Fleabag was the emotional wreck. Fleabag on the inside had a lot of emotions that were overwhelming to her, but she couldn't deal with that. So she made her boyfriend, that first boyfriend um, in season one, feel that way. Um, so there were a few moments where there were three moments where her defenses couldn't be used, which I think were interesting to, that we should look at. So there's that scene with the banker when she is at the retreat and she's being very quiet and they bump into each other at the retreat. Very, very, this is the scene that made me fall in love with the show because up until this point I was like, oh, this is kind of a funny show. It's kind of this raunchy, funny show. And then this scene happened and I was like, whoa, this show has depth. <laughs> and so the Fleabag and the banker, they really co connect. And the reason why is because she has to be quiet. Or at least she perceives that, you know, she's playing a game or something. Because that's part of the whole retreat thing is she can't talk. And one of the main ways that she uses her, def her defenses is by talking, using humor, uh, avoiding projective identification, all this stuff. And when, when she can't talk, it's hard for her to use her defenses. So things get broken down and he expresses his true vulnerability and his sadness. He, and so for the first time, someone talking to her actually in the show anyway, really just is like a real human being to her and is like, I am sad and I'm vulnerable and I'm alone. And it touches her. And it, it gets under her skin. And because she can't talk back and make a joke, it, it's allowed to kind of breathe. And she's not allowed to use her normal defenses. They can't kick in in that moment. And then when those defenses come down, her inner sadness is finally able to be felt by her. Or at least kind of felt. And she says... I just want to cry all the time. And this is when she acknowledges that deep shame and sadness and grief that she feels, but she doesn't. And through with that, 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 that very economical, you know, economic phrase that Phoebe Waller bridge writes, I just want to cry all the time. It says so much, right? It's like, I want to cry all the time, but it also says I have deep sadness. It also says I'm suppressing it because I'm afraid of it. Because if I start crying, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to cry and cry and cry. And I hear this from clients. They'll say, I feel like I want to cry, but I'm, I, I don't want to start crying because I feel like I'll never stop. And this is a defense, which again, can work under some circumstances. Like when I had to put my cat down and go to work, I had to function. I, I, I couldn't, I mean, I could have cried at work, but it wouldn't have been helpful, really. It would have been the end of the world, of course, but there was a time for that later and I had the time later. So there's nothing wrong with suppression, but the problem is, is when it's all the time and you're never allowed to actually get your needs met, which is to actually cry. And so what people will do is they'll start to have these belief systems that help them to uphold their defenses. Like if I start crying, I'm never going to stop. That's not true. That's never happened in the history of humans. No one has ever started to cry and then never stopped for years and years. <laughs> That's just never happened. I'm here to tell you. Uh, and I know it feels that way, but it's not true. And if it was kind of true, like, what if I start crying and I just cry a lot over the next couple of months? What I tell people is, well, uh, then God bless you. I mean, I'm glad that you're able to get that out because you deserve that. Your body doesn't cry uh, because it's something's wrong. I mean, you're, there's nothing wrong with you because you want to cry. 
It's actually a good impulse. It's like saying, I, it's, I know it's a gross analogy, but it's like saying, well, what if I go to the bathroom and I just keep going and going? Well, anyone would say, well, if you got that much crap in you, like you got to let it out. And I guess, I guess if you poop for two months, I mean, get started now. Cause, uh, if you keep suppressing that shit, literally, um, it's just going to be worse for you in the future and in the present. So no time like the present, uh, then, to, uh, and yeah, I guess if you have two months of crying ahead of you, then get started because it's only backing up. <laughs> so, um, but she has that defense of, of this belief system of just like, you know, I, I can't cry. I just, I just can't do that. Or no one is around to be there with me as I cry. It's such a great scene um, b between the banker and her. I just thought it was just so interesting. You know, uh, the first scene at the bank and then the second scene at the retreat and then the third scene at the end of the season uh, that is the last fade out scene where they're at the caf cafe and he, she's getting her loan. It's just this powerful thing. Another moment where she doesn't have her um, <clears throat> defenses is, is at the end of season one. She's all alone. Uh, that hot guy dumped her. Her ex-boyfriend has moved on. Her dad pushes her away uh, for her new wife, you know, for the stepmom, you know, chooses the stepmom over her. The sister thinks that she tried to have sex uh, with her husband. Uh, she can't distract anymore. She's at a real low point. And she goes to a bridge and she's about to kill herself. And then she has this moment where she finally realizes that everyone makes mistakes and it's okay. And that's like the whole point of the show. I just, I just thought that was a real wonderful moment in the show. Uh, another moment where she didn't have her defenses available to her was when her sister pulls away from her in season two, I think, because her sister uh, thinks Fleabag hit on her husband. Um, she can't use her defenses in this moment, and she pleads with her sister to believe her. She's like, you have to believe me. He was the one who tried to kiss me. But the sister doesn't believe her, and they get into a verbal fight, and then the sister, so at this point, she's letting down her defenses. She's being vulnerable. She's reaching out to her sister, even though there's a whole side of her schema that is like, no one loves you. You are a terrible person. No one is going to be there. But she's like, I can't take this anymore. I have to reach across the, the divide and try to grab my sister and hold her close. She doesn't do it in a good way. She doesn't say, please don't leave me. What she says is, you're stupid for believing that your husband didn't try to kiss me because he did. They get into a fight. The sister gets defensive, says something hostile and says, you know, how can I believe you after what you did to Boo? Meaning, how do I believe that you didn't hit on my husband when you had sex with your best friend's boyfriend? And no one has been talking about this aspect of the loss or the loss at all. It's a big moment. It's a big, big trigger for her. And at this point, all of her defenses, you know, come away, the humor, everything. And this is such an interesting scene because she comes face to face with her shame and she looks at the camera just as she always does. I get chills thinking about it. You know, she had, throughout the show, she's been looking at us, but it's always been this sort of like um, superior look. Like we're in on the joke and all these other people are idiots kind of a thing. Um, or let me let you in on this fun thing that I'm doing. It was, it's always like the superior. I, you and me, watcher of t t this TV show, we're in this together. We know what's going on. The rest of the world is stupid. And this moment is the realization, uh, for us anyway, of like, oh my God, the reason why her best friend killed herself was because Fleabag had sex with her best friend's boyfriend. That's why her friend is dead. That's why her friend tried to kill herself. And Fleabag knows that we know now because, you know, Fleabag's been looking at us this whole time and Fleabag knows that we know. And then Fleabag runs away from us in shame. She looks at us into the camera 
and backs away like, oh my God, I've got to get away from you because you know now and you are going, you now hate me and you're going to reject me. It's just this powerful moment. It just makes the, the experience of watching this show just so much weirder and realer, like a Black Mirror episode or something. It's like, you know, we're made to identify with our characters, but uh, this takes it to a whole other level. You know, she looks at us directly in the eyes, Fleabag, and is like, oh my God, you know, you know what I did and you hate me now and I'm ashamed and I'm, and I'm you know, pulling away from you. I'm, I'm completely alone. I don't even have you, the watcher, anymore. It's pretty amazing. So another thing to talk about here in terms of the psychology is to talk about grief directly. You know, again, she had these major losses, her mom, Boo, um, even her family's homeostasis. With her mom dying, it threw off the way her family came together. You know, each member of this family had a very uh, important role. You had dad, who was the stable one, but the cold one. You had mom, who was the chaotic, fun one, but also a little neglecting. You had the sister, who was the star of the family. And you had Fleabag, who was like the cute one and the funny one and the distractor. And to some extent, the, the truth teller. Um, and so to have that homeostasis lost, that's a big deal. But again, obviously losing your best friend and your mom, that's a big blow as well. So... Uh, these losses were complicated by the fact that, you know, if you have, if your mom suffers from cancer and it's five years and then she dies or, uh, you know, old age, as they say, she's 89 and she dies, you've been preparing for it for the last 10 years, maybe mentally, emotionally. But when someone just suddenly dies from suicide, out of the blue, and they died because of something you did, that's going to complicate that grief. Like it's not just you're not it's not just a loss. You didn't just lose a friend. A friend didn't just die. They died because of you, and they died because of suicide. It was violent. And when they when you know the best friend died, she killed two other people. So that complicates. Um, the, uh, the grief. Another thing that complicates the grief is that the mom was immediately replaced by the stepmom, who was a friend of the mom and the kid's godmother. So that's going to complicate the grief because the stepmom was interfering with the grief process of that family because she was insecure terribly. Um, part of the grief process in this show that is depicted very well, I think, is the culture of London, the culture of, of Britain, or of mainstream London, shall I say. This whole notion of keep calm and carry on. You know, for a while, I kind of liked those memes or those posters. I think it's from like World War II when the bombing was going on. They would have these, these um, posters. I, 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 I guess I could look it up, but I'm not going to bother anyway. The point is, is that you've all seen those keep calm and carry on things. And it's like, oh, it's kind of this cute little phrase from England. At least I think it is. But over time, I've learned to dislike these posters because they're emblematic of emotional avoidance. Okay, if you're going through a bombing raid and you have to keep calm and carry on and get to the bomb shelter and you don't have time to complain or you don't have time to cry, you got to get safe, then yeah, keep calm and carry on. But we have in, you know, Seattle culture, uh, we're in that direction. I think London is, you know, particularly bad in this way of this notion of just like, hey, keep calm, carry on, let's make a joke. That's why I think English people are so good with humor you know, Britain, Brits and Irish people, they're, they're so fucking funny, Canadians, because they're even worse than Americans when it comes to emotional suppression in general. And what's one of the best ways to suppress is through humor. And that's great. And it, you know, can make you really funny, but it also is horrible. And so uh, this culture of keeping calm and carrying on is uh, going to make grief a lot harder, if not impossible. And it's a bit of a classist thing, too. It's not just 
uh, you know, mainstream Anglo culture, but it's also a class thing and it's in, it's in the United States as well. There's this notion that we have that emotions are for the lower classes, uh, that it's um, important to be polite uh, and it's okay to be secretly angry and hostile. So if, if you're going to be angry and hostile, you got to do it in a polite, passive aggressive way. Um, also in a classist culture, you know, like, you know, there was this dichotomy between sex as this like real human thing and it being an art form, right? There's, it's like, it's okay to talk about it in this art form by through this classy art show, but it's not okay to talk about it in real life. Um, there's just this notion uh, of the upper classes of just like, uh, things have to be expressed in a certain way. And if you express it not in that way, then you are, you are not one of us. You're not one of the upper classes. And so that's going to complicate your grief as well, because to just start sobbing and just to talk about how your life is going down the tubes and to actually reach out and say, I need a hug is associated with lower class. Um, also, it seems as though Fleabag had no one to talk with about her grief. Family avoided emotions. She didn't have any friends, so that's going to make it hard for her. And again, she used all of her defenses of humor. Like when she did talk about the loss, uh, she would use humor. Like with the cab driver. She brings it up with the cab driver. She's like, well, yeah, I know my best friend killed herself. And, you know, she killed two people in the process, you know, so she's such a dick. And because, you know, in this scene, Fleabag is like, uh, wants to talk about the grief. She, she wants to get it off her chest. She has a very normal impulse of just like, I, I got to tell someone about what happened and I can't tell my family for whatever reason. So I'll just tell this cab driver, but because of her defense mechanisms, they kick in. And so she makes this funny sh story of it. And so in doing this, she sh shoots herself in the foot because she, she, she's really trying to seek nurturing nurturance and care from 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 another human being but because she makes it into a joke it really puts off the cab driver and the cab driver is also actually repulsed by her very it, so again she's uh, through her defenses she's pushed back into her hole but her grief is trying to be expressed sometimes like she goes to the cemetery every day but instead of actually crying she remains superficial at the cemetery and judges a stranger. So there's a part of her that wants to grieve. She goes to the cemetery every day, but she can't get herself to emote. And so she, and let her emotions out. So she remains superficial. Another way she expresses her grief is by calling Boo's voicemail just to hear her voice. She deals with her grief a little bit more in season two by helping her sister find a better life. So she tries to help other people. Uh, she tries to get back at Martin, um, you know, the, the husband of her sister. She starts to reconnect with her father. She starts to actually like, okay, not only did I lose my mom, but I kind of lost my dad too, because my mom helped me connect to my dad. So I'm going to reconnect to my dad. Um, she grieves a little bit with her father, not a lot, but a little bit. Uh, she tries to express true love with the priest. It's again, dysfunctional, but it's allowing herself to feel some feelings. Um, so, and then I think the final sort of grief thing that she does is she steals the mom statue from the stepmom for the last time, which I think was a aspect of her grief. I think she has a lot more grieving to do, but I think we're left to believe at the end of season two that she's on her way to express her grief in a functional way. All right, the last thing we'll talk about here is gender, how gender is presented in this TV show. The first thing that I wanna talk about is the retreat that they go on. In this retreat, I think it's quite purposeful what um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge decided to do with this retreat. The women in this retreat are to remain silent. They are to remain calm. They are to not speak and they are to clean the house, uh, 
so at the retreat, the women can't talk. They do yoga and meditation, and they do all these cleaning activities in, in silence. Meanwhile, the men are on the other side of the compound yelling at women. Uh, they have these blow-up dolls of women, and the, these like just regular dudes are all standing around, mild-mannered, pent-up dudes, standing around yelling at these blow-up dolls of women and saying things like, you slut, and that kind of thing. And they're encouraged to do that. And it's both ridiculous because it's like, okay, that's really stupid. Like the women are supposed to be silent and the men are supposed to yell slut at a blow-up doll. But it's also um, obviously emblematic of society how women are supposed to be quiet and clean and men are supposed to be angry. But it's also quite poignant because if a um, retreat like this actually existed, I could see it actually helping people. I wouldn't recommend that people be shunted into the, the female version and the male version. I, I would like everyone to participate in both activities. Getting your anger out can actually be quite powerful. So although, it, as with a lot of things with this show, there's a lot of ridiculousness, but also poignancy and reality to it. It's both surreal because a retreat like this probably doesn't exist, but it's also quite caring in the way that, so, you know, uh, flea bags watching the men yell slut, slut at these blow up dolls, but it's not. It's done in a way of making fun of it, but also in a way that is a little sympathetic to the men. The men seem like they're suffering too, and that they have a lot of pent up anger. Also, being silent can actually really be therapeutic. To just be quiet, to be with your thoughts, and to be with others in that space, and to have no responsibilities, and just to have time to think and be in the moment can be very uh, helpful. Another thing about gender in this show is around sex and sex positivity. This show, uh, in a way, can be quite sex positive for women. It, uh, Fleabag, this woman, she likes having sex. She has, and she's not ashamed of it. And she doesn't have any real bad things happen to her because she likes sex. And she masturbates. And she masturbates and, you know, in the relationship with her boyfriend, she's the one who's masturbating and her boyfriend is the one who is, who feels threatened by her masturbating. Stereotypically, it's the other way around. Obviously, women masturbate and men can be threatened by that in the same way that women can be threatened by uh, men masturbating uh, and obviously in same-sex couples as well. So this notion, you know, when you think about, oh, masturbation and, you know, uh, it, it, in TV shows anyway, it's usually depicted as a male thing. So it was um, this show, Fleabag, pr proposes that, hey, you know, women masturbate. And, and not, not all women do, but certainly some and one woman can masturbate like this and it's fine. She talks openly about her sexuality. Um, there's also the art show, the stepmother's uh, sex, what's she, the sex exhibition. <laughs> There's also these mild lesbian encounters between Fleabag and other, and other women that is dealt with, I thought, really well. Uh, it's not pathologized or somehow something really evil or something. It's just like Fleabag. We're not really quite sure if Fleabag is actually bisexual or just sexually acting out but it's uh, it's sexuality in the show is just dealt with like yeah people have sex no biggie uh, so i thought the gender regarding that was notable um there were a couple moments where i just had to wonder if the genders were reversed and whether or not that matters it's not always well let me let me propose a scene like there's this scene where the flea bag, she goes to the physician and the physician is performing a breast exam because her mom died of breast cancer. And so, so she regularly goes to the physician to have her breasts examined. 
And as is her way, she, in that moment, probably feels quite scared of getting breast cancer and also starts to feel the grief of the loss of her mother who died from breast cancer. And is probably reminded of that when she goes to the doctor to have her breast exam. And to defend herself against that pain, she uses humor. And she starts to, and she, and she uses perverted humor, and she starts to creep out on the physician. So as she's getting this breast exam, she's essentially hitting on uh, the physician and saying lewd things, saying um, sexually inappropriate things, and the physician is not being receptive to it. And this scene is quite funny. It's like, you know, this funny little scene. But if we reversed the genders, which again isn't always um, an indication of something being terrible. If we rever reverse the gender, so you say, yeah, there's a guy and he goes to see a female doctor to uh, examine his scrotum and he starts making all these jokes like, ooh, feels good. I like being touched down there. How would we feel about a scene like that? How do we feel about a character like that? How would we feel about someone who wrote a scene like that? Uh, we would be, I hope, quite grossed out by that. We would think, I don't like this show. I don't want to watch it. Uh, this scene is promoting essentially rape culture and um, toxic masculinity, all that kind of stuff. And it would be. But somehow when we reverse the genders and the woman is doing it to the, to the male uh, the you know the female patient is doing it to the male physician. It's this quaint little funny scene, a little awkward, but not seemingly politically problematic. Now, uh, so on one hand, I want to say that we can't really reverse the genders because in our society, the directionality of pain and abuse is often between directed from men to women, especially when we think about casual encounters, uh, the women walk around and get whistled at or get treated in a certain way. And in the media, women are objects of sex and this sort of thing. And men are allowed to have personalities when they're in movies and that kind of thing. Uh, obviously it's not, it's not entirely that way and it's getting better, but those are the, uh, things that we have to look at. So when we look at a scene like this, it is perhaps okay for it to be this direction because it's like, well, in, in the scheme of our society, uh, this scene isn't emblematic of an ongoing problem. Whereas if you reverse the genders and a male is doing it to a female physician, then that is emblematic of something that is really quite troubling in our society that happens a lot. On the other hand, a lot of women are sexually abusing people and a lot of men are being sexually abused. And it's such an underground thing that a lot of people don't even think it could ever happen to the point where when you have a male student who's 15 or 14 or 13 and he has sex with quote unquote, a hot teacher, a female teacher, a lot of people are like, ah, oh, good for him. You reverse the genders, it's, it's this terrible, abusive thing to the, to the child. And for these young men, these 13-year-old, or these boys, these 13-year-old boys, they often don't get the support to be able to come forward and say, I feel quite violated by this and, and abused. And so uh, these stories don't get told because they don't feel like society will hear them. So... Uh, on one hand, so, so on this other hand, uh, if this scene should be actually pointed out as fairly problematic uh, and not just a silly little humorous scene, for a physician to be with a patient who is doing that to him, you know, that could be quite troublesome for that, for that physician. Now, a lot of people are like, well, hey, you know, the physician has power and the, the physician can 
end the exam anytime he wants and blah, blah, blah. And okay, part of that's true. I'm, it's not like she's invading his house or something or, or she's sexually harassing him and she has power over him. But I think it is, it's just worth looking at. We all, I think, can do well to look at the messages that are in our society today and just raise a little question. Doesn't mean I, for me, it doesn't mean I reject this show. It also doesn't mean I don't laugh at that scene, but it does mean that we raise the question because throughout our history, we always do better when we raise those questions. Doesn't mean we're banning something or we're being a party pooper. It just means we're raising these questions because what's the chance in 50 years, they're gonna look back at us in 2019 and think that we had solved all of our social problems. When I look back at humor that, that I used to think was hilarious 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I'm quite mortified at the way that I remember I reacted to certain things. Eddie Murphy stand-ups from the 80s about gay people or, uh, gosh, who else from back then? Uh, nothing's coming to mind, but certain uh, tropes that were really quite utilized by com comedians back then and were considered to be not problematic and super hilarious. And we look at them today and we think, huh, that's problematic. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a lot of stigma in that joke and there's a lot of harm in that joke. And um, the chance that we are we're over that and we'll, you know, we're completely fine today is, is next to zero. There's no way. So undoubtedly in the future, there's going to be some problems. And 50 years from now, I suspect when they look back at that scene, they're going to be like, oh, that's, uh, that's a little interesting. Anyway, so if we look at uh, other gender, uh, I don't know, scenes, if you will, <laughs> uh, ways in which Phoebe Waller-Bridge explores gender in Fleabag in an interesting way was the scene between Fleabag and the award winner when uh, the older woman who gets the award and she has to track her down and get back the award and they go to this bar and they get a martini to get together. And the award winner, this older woman, is uh, kind of a mentor for Fleabag in this moment. And the woman, the older woman, she resents getting the award because it's the award is for women in business. You know, it's like successful women in business award. I can't remember the exact award, but it's something like that. And she really resents it. She, she said, it's sort of the kids table of awards, which I thought was really interesting. And although on, uh, I understand why we have awards like this, you know, women in film or women in academia or women in business or uh, Asian Americans in business, these, these kinds of awards. I understand it because we live in a racist, sexist society that uh, gives a lot of awards and whether it's formal or informal benefits to uh, white males. And so we have to um, have sort of uh, sanctioned off award systems or recognition systems for people who aren't, aren't traditionally um, acknowledged. Uh, so I get that, but I also get this, the flip side of it of just like getting an award like that is like the kids table of awards because it's like, well, you're not going to get an award if we match you up against men. So you're pretty good for a woman. You know what I mean? And so you're, you're the best of the women business people. Um, instead of just being a good business person, um, you're you're good for a woman is kind of that the implication of course you know again i see both sides to that but uh this this character in fleabag talks about that and then she talks about how women are born with pain and that you know women are born with childbirth and periods and you know they're women are just born with pain where and men are not uh, men uh, ha have to create pain like wars and rugby and so that they can touch other humans, whereas women have childbirth and they have this 
connection with humans that they don't have to engineer through wars and rugby. I thought that was interesting. And then she goes on to talk about how menopause is both horrible, but also uh, provides a lot of freedom because after you go, you know, you live your whole life as, as just a machine with parts, she talks about. She's like, you know, after you go through menopause, you're no longer a machine with parts. You just have to watch the scene. And I, I'm guessing you have. It's really an interesting scene. And then she says, um, after menopause, you're no longer a, mach- a machine that, that with, with parts. You're just a person who works. <laughs> you're just like a regular person now. And I thought that was interesting. And I, I think as points to Phoebe Waller-Bridge's, uh, I don't know, progressiveness and her understanding of how society works. Okay, so I think I'll just end it there. I have more notes, but they're probably not important or interesting to go into. Let me know what you think. Any ideas of Fleabag's personality? Do you think I got it right? Do you think I got it wrong? Let me know. You can go to our website and fill out the Contact Us page. That's the way I prefer that you reach out to me because it asks all the important questions. And uh, as always, become a patron of the podcast if you haven't already. Also, join us on Facebook. That's the main place where we do all of our announcements and we play different uh, games and I, I do polls and whatnot. And also join us on YouTube Live on Thursdays at 2 o'clock Seattle time. I do question and answer and often Umberto will join me there. So anyway, uh, please take care of yourself and take care of other people because we all deserve it. (laughs) 